This is a production of Cornell University. Previously at, with USDA, my focus was mostly on plant biology and looking at plant physiology in the context of CO2 and climate. But today, what I want to try and do is to give you some sense of what the public health consequences are, and we consider this as the good, um, <coughs> the bad, and oh my God. Um, so before I do that, however, I want to introduce you to sort of the basic concepts. Um, I'm sure a lot of this is review for some of you that may be new. Uh, humanity produces carbon dioxide. Any source of carbon, whether that source of carbon is coal or gasoline, whatever, if you oxidize it, you burn it. Carbon, oxygen, carbon dioxide. Um, so about 90% of that comes from fossil fuels and cement about 10% from deforestation, um, about 50% stays in the atmosphere, a quarter of it goes back into the land through photosynthesis, and about a quarter of it is making the oceans and water sources more acidic. Um, you've seen the Keeling curve before, I'm sure, uh, but this is uh, historically the, the highest CO2 we've seen in the last million years or so, and um, it's really unprecedented in how quickly it's rising, particularly in geological <coughs> terms. If you look at the different projections of where it will go, um, depends on the model. You have the green line here, which I refer to as the everyone hold hands and drive a Prius line. And then you have this dash line, which is the business as usual line, and that's pretty much where we're headed at the moment. So there's been very little effort, even with the Paris uh, Accords and so forth, and actually uh, removing or, or lowering our, our carbon emissions. So the question I often get asked is, well, okay, who gives a flying fig whether or not carbon dioxide is 300 or 400 or 500 or 800 parts per million? What difference is it? Right? Well, the major difference is an indirect effect due to warmer temperatures. And if you look at the overall uh, con composition of the air, you see all the major gases, but then you see two that are very uh, important, even though they're in small quantities, and those are considered to be global warming gases. And then some, well, what does that mean? What does that mean if I have a global warming gas? What, what's special about them? And the, the special thing about them is that they're musical. And let me explain that. Um, well, before I do, any, anybody here that plays a stringed instrument? Any musicians in the group? Excellent. Um, oh, you too, thank you. So my question is for you. Oh, great. <laughs> um, let's say that I tune two strings to the same key. Okay, they're both next to each other and they're tuned to the same frequency. And I hit one key or one string, what would the string next to it do? It'll vibrate, right? It'll resonate. What if I'm a Republican? <laughs> okay, all right. Um, it's a basic physical concept in that resonance that when you have something that's tuned to a certain frequency, it will vibrate, it will absorb some energy that the other string is putting out. Well, it turns out this is also true for molecules. And these particular molecules, carbon dioxide and water vapor, the molecular bonds are such that they resonate. They don't keep resonate in the key of A, like a guitar string, but they resonate in the key of infrared. So whenever they come into contact with heat, they resonate. They would absorb some heat that would otherwise be lost. And that is part of the natural greenhouse effect. Um, without water vapor and without carbon dioxide, the average surface temperature would be about minus 18 degrees Celsius. We'd all be sitting around a farm, you know, in a, in a fire and, you know, shivering. So this natural greenhouse effect is one of the reasons why life is, in fact, possible. But one little variation on this is that, remember, it's CO2 and water vapor. And you'll notice that the temperature increase on the globe is not uniform. You say global warming of one degree, but that's an average. It's not rising the same way everywhere. Why? Why? What, what, what's going on? Well, you have two different greenhouse gases. So where on the earth is the air warm and moist and water vapor is the dominant greenhouse gas? Tropics, absolutely. So rising carbon dioxide is going to cause that to be a little bit warmer, a little warmer. <coughs> Right? but it's not going to have a huge effect because water vapor is the dominant gas. Now flip that around. Where is the air dry? 
doesn't hold a lot of water vapor, and therefore it's going to have a faster rate of warming. Oh, poles, absolutely. See, we have the psychic friends connection going here. Where else is the air warm and dry? Deserts, right? So we expect to see increasing desertification, right? As you go up in altitude, the air becomes drier. So greater effect in terms of altitude, greater effect in terms of seasons, with winter temperatures warming more than summer temperatures locally. Okay, so that is sort of a key twist to understand when we talk about global warming or climate change is that the surface temperature is not changing the same way because of these distribution of water vapor and carbon dioxide. Hopefully that's on the same page on that. Now, there's gonna be some plant biology consequences of this, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, less temperature increase of water vapor is high, but more precipitation. Greater temperature increase with latitude or altitude, increasing desertification, increasing drought, right? So rising sea levels from increased polar and glacial melt. There's another reason why you should give a flying pig. Plants are essential to life. What are the four things plants need to grow? I picked on you once already. <laughs> what do plants need to grow? Water, light. Water. I'm not trying to trick you. <laughs> right? What, I heard water, I think. All right, so water, light, nutrients, carbon dioxide. Is that a fair assessment? Those are the four major resources. Okay. Suppose, to your imagination, suppose for the sake of argument that the amount of nitrogen in the soils all over the world had gone up by 25% in your lifetime. Would that have an impact on plant biology? Of course. And here's the $64 million. <coughs> Would every plant species respond the same way to that change? Oh, God. What does that mean in terms of ecology? What does that mean in terms of biodiversification? What does that mean in terms of crop production? What does that mean in terms of evolution? Now you can remove your imagination because we know that carbon dioxide has in fact gone up by 30% in my lifetime. I'm older, so. So it's gonna alter global plant biology. Well, but that's a good thing. I mean, I know it's a good thing because I went to the ExxonMobil website and I saw this slide. <laughs> <laughs> this is Loblolly Pine. And if I give Loblolly Pine more carbon dioxide, it grows more. Yay! That's great. Loblolly Pine. Wow, that's so cool. It grows more when I give it more CO2. Uh, any foresters here? Anybody study forestry? Really? No? What happens when, it, when a tree goes, when it, if, what happens to the, the uh, quality of the wood for a tree that grows very quickly? Does it become weaker? Oh, yeah. I didn't find that on the website, <laughs> oddly enough. And there's another thing I didn't find on the website. It turns out that not all plants are good for you. I know. I know. Crazy <laughs> stuff, right? It turns out that <laughs> there are plants like kudzu that also respond to carbon dioxide. So to come out and say, well, it's all gonna be uniformly beneficial, but CO2 is gonna be the mankind's great savior, uh, it's gonna be the second garden of Eden, which was actually in a Wall Street Journal lot dead. No, not gonna happen. Are there gonna be consequences? Oh yeah, it's a fundamental resource for plant growth. Plants are beneficial to some parts, but not all parts of human society. Not all plants respond the same way. And there's going to be qualitative components of plant biology. So we're on the same page now, I hope, in terms of understanding the consequences of climate and carbon dioxide with regard to plants. So let's look at it now in terms of health. And let's focus for a moment on the good. Malaria is considered to be a worldwide scourge. Between 400 and 500,000 children under the age of five die every year from malaria particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. There are many different ways that people have used to 
counter malaria, to cure malaria once you've been affected. One of them is through artemisinin, particularly what are called artemisinin combination therapies. Artemisinin, which is a plant-based product, goes from the lab and then different uh, things are added to it. Um, but it basically is used, the artemisinin kills the plasmodium parasite, but there's some additional drugs that are added to it so that it can't re reoccur. But this is the source for, Arte for artemisinin, artemisia annua, sweet. <coughs> and this is the weird chemical with this strong peroxide bridge that is used to kill plasmodia. Now, the question is, if plants respond to CO2, then what is the response of this plant to CO2, and particularly, what does it do to the concentration, excuse me, of artemisinin? And that's what we've tried to find out. Sorry, this was some of the issue um, information from the previous slide, the long-acting drugs that are added to our artemisinin in order to make sure that the plasmodium doesn't recur. So what have recent changes in CO2 done to this particular chemical? And to find out, we looked at free air CO2 enrichment studies for artemisinin and content, it's a high carbon compound, there's no nitrogen, we looked at the C to N ratio, and saw a very good correlation between C to N and carbon dioxide. We used this relationship to then go to different herbarium throughout China and to look at artemisium that had been collected since the early 1900s when the CO2 was about 300, 310 parts per million, and then through to about 385 parts per million. And what we found was that the estimated artemisinin in these concentrations pretty much mimicked what was happening to the CO2 concentration atmospherically. And we then tested this in a field experiment where we actually gave the plants more carbon dioxide and produced more artemisinin. As a result of these experiments, people in China and the, the drug company that produces artemisinin is now growing them under high CO2 so they can get more artemisinin per unit per plant under these conditions. So it's increasing the concentration of a drug which is used to counteract malaria. Cool. So it's a common weed, but maybe an essential pharmacological resource and recent increases seem to be associated with an increase in that particular drug. Are there other plant-based drugs that could be responding? I don't know. We haven't looked there yet. What native medicines, what native plants are being affected? Two to three billion people in the world don't go to the corner Walgreens to get their prescription filled. I know. Right? They rely on native plants as a source of medicine. How are those plants been affected by carbon dioxide? How are they being affected in terms of distribution by climate change? What about the bad? Well, I don't know about you, I suffer from seasonal allergies. And from a seasonal allergy point of view, there are main, three major sources, trees, springtime, weeds and grasses in the summer, and ragweed principally in the fall. And ragweed being a short day plant is a pretty good model to start with. So we started with this <coughs> in uh, chambers, growth chambers, where we could modify the carbon dioxide and collect the pollen from the catkins. We looked at, this was done in the late 90s, and we looked at 280 parts per million pre-industrial CO2, 370 at the time, ambient, and then 600. And we saw, this is grams per plant, and dry, dry biomass, and perhaps more to the point, this is pollen production. So five grams per plant at pre-industrial, 11 grams per plant, end of the 20th century, 600, or 20 grams per plant, probably sometime this century. Not only is ragweed increasing its pollen production, but Ben Singer, who was a med student at the time, did some ELISA work, also showing that the concentration of Ambien A1, the principal allergen, on the pollen was actually going up too. The concentration was changing. So, wow, that's kind of interesting. Does it mean anything? Oh, come on, it's a chamber study. 
right? This is a chamber study. Nobody cares about chamber studies, right? So how do you how do you build up on that? How do you go from the lab to the real world? Money. <laughs> I'm not lying. This is the face system. Um, this was done at Duke Forest, and uh, you can see the scale. I hopefully here a little bit. These are the the uh, pipes that are pushing carbon dioxide into the center of this ring. Now, you may not be able to see it, but there looks like a little semicolon here. That's actually a railroad track. They had to bring a six ton tank of carbon dioxide on a daily basis in order to provide the carbon dioxide to fumigate these rigs. The bill alone for carbon dioxide was a million dollars a year. I had $2,000 in discretionary funds. <laughs> Five minutes of time was not gonna do it for me. So how do I do this? How do I go from the chamber to the real world? No. Hmm. <clears throat> Healing curve. Mauna Loa. Mauna Loa. Why do you suppose they monitor carbon dioxide in Mauna Loa. I mean, sure, you know, Hawaii, gosh, you know, great daiquiris. Um, but why Hawaii? What do you think? Any ideas? Time shares? It's where it was stable, right? And, uh, and no influence from industry. Exactly. Exactly. Hawaii is the most isolated, geographically isolated spot on Earth. And they monitor it at 10,000 feet. Trust me when I tell you the carbon dioxide in this room is not 405 parts per million. It's 600 or 700 parts per million. Right? Ah. Maybe what we can do is to look at ragweed along a urban-rural gradient where the city, which is already warmer, and has more carbon dioxide would be a harbinger of things to come. And you know what? It's cheap. It doesn't cost me a million dollars a year. So that's what we did. We dug our sites. Uh, the inner harbor of Baltimore was our urban site, suburban, and we had an organic farm as a rural site. We moved our soil, we made it uniform, we added uh, monitoring. And I'm sorry, as an academic, I have to show you at least one slide that nobody in the back row can see. <laughs> so this is my slide. Um, and I know it's hard to locate, but basically the carbon dioxide from rural to suburban to urban went up in four year. Um, nighttime temperature went up, change in season length, the number of frost free days went up. Um, we were worried about ozone, but we saw whenever we had an ozone event in the city, Within a four to five hour period, we were seeing the same ozone event out in the in the suburbs and the rural site. So there was more nitrogen being deposited in the urban site, uh, but we had our own soil, which had a high amount of nitrogen to begin with, and so the amount of nitrogen difference was small relative to the amount of nitrogen we had in our initial soil. The initial soil was the same; it had the same seed bank. We watered it along the transect, tried to maintain it as uniform as possible. Um, so, all right, just some pictures here. If you look closely, you'll see Jimmy Hoffa, right? <laughs> um, doing all that. This is our monitor, and we use rotor rods to monitor the pollen. And this is our ragweed pollen from the farm site, the suburban site, and the downtown site. This is on a per plant basis, uh, where the curves are basically um, averaged. So being a short day plant, it started to flower here on the farm site, or control site, if you will. Um, around, around this time, maximized around 245 days and then stopped. These two arrows essentially correspond to the beginning and maximum time at the farm <coughs> site. You can see it's flowering a little bit earlier in the suburban, a lot earlier in the downtown site, and basically on average, if you look at the area under the curve, a ragweed plant growing under high CO2 or warm, more CO2 and warmer temperatures is producing about tenfold more pollen than the same plant growing in the farm. Cool. Cool. We went from the chamber to an outdoor experiment. All right.
It's a global problem. I showed this to the folks at Science and Nature, and they said, nah, enough. It's a global problem, dummy. Got to do a global solution. Okay, okay, okay. Now I'm really stuck. What do I do now? Oh, I use that very sophisticated instrument on my desk. Hello? You don't know me. Oh, but you're an allergist, right? I'm a plant physiologist from USA. No, don't, don't hang up. Don't hang up. Okay. All right, hello. So I called up allergists around the country, and I said, can you help me? I'm looking to see if you have any long-term data on the start and end of the ragweed season. I want to see if within recent decades there has been a climate-induced change in the season length of, of ragweed exposure. And I want to compare it to a global model, because the global model, remember, based on carbon dioxide and water vapor, is that as I move northward, I want to see a bigger effect. So if I start in the environs of East Texas, where it's warm and humid, and go up to Canada, I should ostensibly see a change in the ragweed season. So I found enough folks who were interested, and this is what we saw. That going from the East Texas, it's not direct, but as we went from East Texas up into Southern Canada, over the last, since the 90s, the season has changed, and has changed in real time. And this got published in PNAS. So, all right, well, that's, that's better. Let's do the world. So, hi, I've used email this time. So, <laughs> hi, you don't know me. I published at PNAS. Oh, yes, I want to be part of it. Okay, so what we've been doing now is to look at not just ragweed, but to look at all flowering species for as many different locations in the northern hemisphere that we could find. And the longest one we had was actually, the longest data we had was from Turku, Finland, going back to the 1970s. This is total seasonal pollen. The total amount of pollen from spring through fall and looking at the change as a function of year. And this is for Finland, um, this is for Reykjavik, Iceland, um, Kansas City, Missouri, Eva, Switzerland. And there's a lot of variation in the data, I won't go through all of it, but if you look at the, each of these is a separate point along from, from different locations. And this is a percent change, percent change in pollen load per year as a function of changes in T max and T min over that time period. And so what we're seeing is that the temperature increase as it goes up is also driving the overall pollen load per year for both the maximum and the minimum temperatures. So we are seeing in real time with temperature a change in the cumulative amount of pollen that you are being exposed to. Okay, so the bad, changes in pollen season, changes in pollen amounts, changes in pollen allergenicity. Okay, let's go to the OMG part. It's gonna take a minute. All right, turns out that fire frequency can be associated with potassium levels in plant material. The less potassium, the more potassium you have, the less heat you put out. The less potassium, vice versa, it's inversely correlated. So as CO2 changes, what does that do to potassium concentrations? What does it mean for fire frequency? What does it mean for fire intensity? What does it mean for air quality? What about ozone generation? I mentioned our friend kudzu. You know, plants use volatile organic carbons, right? So what does CO2 do in terms of processing those, that VOCs into ozone? What about contact dermatitis? So we have a little information on this one. It actually comes from the face system with La Bolly Pine that I showed you earlier. Turns out when you give more CO2 to a forest, you know what grows more than the forest? You know what else happens? It becomes more virulent, more, better able to give you contact dermatitis. What about narcotic intensification? Oh, gee, you mean we're actually spending public funds on looking at uh, controlling uh, coca and, um, and uh, poppy around the world? Yes, we are. 
So what happens when CO2 and temperature change where we grow poppy and where we grow coca? Oh. What about food allergies? If CO2 changes quality, does it change polygenicity? A little bit of data for peanut showing that for some varieties it might. What about food safety? As crazy as it sounds, warmer temperatures mean that pathogens might increase. I know, right? So what's the government doing? Well, they've cut the funds for the Food Safety Inspection Service. <laughs> yes, because that makes the most sense, right? Uh, what about herbicide? Um, this is some work, I'm running out of room here, but this is some work on Canada Thistle we did. Um, this is under ambient CO2, sprayed it with glyphosate, got pretty good control. Sprayed it under ele elevated CO2. Uh, elevated CO2 caused the roots to grow more, and so the same amount of herbicide didn't kill the plant, the roots were able to regenerate, and so we got zero control. Okay? Uh, so, um, yeah. All right. I want to focus on just one aspect of the OMG part, if I could, and that's nutrition. There's strong evidence that projected increases in CO2 will reduce protein levels particularly protein levels in many of the basic cereals that feed the world, particularly wheat and rice. Okay. So this is some work that I did just before I left USDA. Uh, this is with polished rice, looking at the percent change in protein concentration between <coughs> 3 and 400. That is the change that's already occurred in CO2. It's about a 5% change. Um, I think seven of the eight lines showed a significant decline. Uh, it's also ubiquitous. This is some work by Daniel Taub um, back in 2008, but showing the number of studies at that time for barley was 20. This is the change in protein concentration, rice, wheat, soybean, and so forth. Worthwhile to point out that for soybean, we did not see a large decline in protein, in part because it's a leguminous plant, it fixes its own nitrogen. So peanut and uh, soybean do not show this change in protein decline with more CO2. Uh, this is some meta-analysis by my colleague, Rakli Lalaz, looking at carbon. Uh, he does have a little bit of copper here, but I don't think it's you know, related to, to wheat or rice per se, but basically, plants are very adaptable. If you change the atmosphere, it becomes carbon-rich, plants are going to have more carbon, <coughs> so it's not going to be able to keep up. There's a dilution effect, there's a, a switch going on there in terms of the IMO. It's not just crops. This is some work by Augustine et al. Uh, this is a seven-year average looking at pasture grass. And you can see the, the cow belching over here. And basically what it found was that under ambient CO2, ambient temperature, ambient CO2, elevated temperature, elevated CO2, ambient, and so forth. Uh, seven-year period, you can see that temperature per se did not have any effect in terms of the protein concentration, but CO2 did. So there was no interaction, but carbon dioxide reduced um, the protein as measured, determined by percent nitrogen. As a result of that change, calves or cows put on weight slower. So it's not just an effect in terms of plants that you eat, but it's also an effect in terms of meat that you consume. Okay. Um, hey, it's just people food, though, right? Well, gee, what if it happens to other things, other living things, like I don't know, bees, right? Um, bees are basically sugar junkies. Uh, they love sugar. They love wherever nectar is and wherever they can get it. And they're so good at it that they do the little wiggle dance, right? It says, oh, you know, 10, ten yards to the left of the 7-Eleven, you can find this uh, sunflower that's got all kinds of sugar. Um, but they also get their protein from pollen. And they're not as good as being able to select for protein sources in nature. They select by size and texture, not by the ability to know how much protein is in that pollen. So to address this issue of recent changes in CO2, remember it's gone up by 30%, we wanted to be able to look at, okay, how has the recent change in carbon dioxide affected the protein concentration of pollen that bees consume? Tough one because bees consume a lot of pollen from a lot of different sources. So we chose goldenrod, um, solidago, canadensis, because it's one of the last sources of flowers that bees, quote unquote, see before they overwinter. Well, how do we get to that? 
we have to go and look at the historical evidence. So where do we go for that? Well, we went to the Smithsonian. <coughs> it's a great place if you've never been. They have your typical dinosaurs, your typical, you know, giant elephants, the Hope Diamond. Uh, and then way in the back, or way in the bottom in the back, uh, right next to the Ark of the Covenant, you'll find all of these, I'm sorry, nobody gets that joke. Um, you'll find all these different herbarium samples of goldenrod. And these herbarium samples go back to the 1840s. Ooh, cool. Let's sample those. Let's see what we get. So we looked at carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen anal analysis because protein, of course, will have degraded in, in the pollen by then. We we'll use nitrogen as a surrogate for protein. And we also wanted to look at experimental evidence. Historical evidence is cool, but what's the experimental evidence? How do we do that? Well, Wayne Pauley of USDA has this really cool system with these little Conestoga wagons that you see here. And what he's doing is he's adding CO2 at one end of the Conestoga wagon. And being that it's in Texas, the sun is shining, folks, this is happening, the CO2 is being reduced. And that CO2 gets moved to the next one, that gets moved to the next one, that gets moved to the next one. And so by the end of the Conestoga wagons, the CO2 is pre-industrial. So we can actually, we're very, very fortunate to have enough solid ego along this transect so we could do both a historical analysis and an experimental analysis. And here's the data from the Smithsonian. Uh, each dot is something like, I don't know, 20 specimens or something, I forgot. Uh, but basically, estimated protein goes down about 25% uh, in the recent um, last 100 years or so. And the carbon nitrogen ratio goes up. And from the experimental um, uh, Conestoga wagon experiment, fewer samples, bigger you know, variation, but generally the same trends that we saw, both experimental and historically. So, um, yeah, it has more than just people food. And we're at the moment, um, a couple months ago, we went back to the Smithsonian. We did another eight or nine taxa doing the same kind of carbon and nitrogen. We haven't analyzed those data yet, but we want to see if this is just a one-off thing or if it's something that's more ubiquitous. Um, so one of the questions then, or one of the hypotheses we pose with this is, okay, if this is happening, then what does it mean for bee health? Is it a contributor to something like colony collapse? And the answer is we don't know. We know that bee health can be important as a means to deal with environmental stressors, but we don't have a direct link as yet. So we'll do a deeper dive. This is a variation of what I showed you for Lavalli Pine, a, freight, a face system here, uh, looking at 18 different lines. These are the 18 different lines of rice for percent protein. Um, pretty ubiquitous among all the different lines. And if you're familiar with rice, this is including hybrids, japonicas, indicas. Um, this is the iron and the zinc composure, a little more variation here, but again, general trend is for a reduction. Um, we wanted to go a little bit more. Uh, we weren't able to do this for all 18 lines, but we did it for nine of the 18. And this is for vitamin B1, B2, B5, and B9. And again, um, there are you know, significant effects, uh, cumulative for all of these and some individuals as well. And then we've got this, alpha tocopherol, vitamin A, which not, yeah, vitamin E, sorry, which went up. Whoa, okay. Uh, why is it going down over here and why is it going up over there? What the hell's going on, right? So we have a firm possibility of a definite maybe, which we will refer to as a working hypothesis for the moment, and that is that it's related to the carbon-nitrogen issue. But if I have a compound that has a lot of carbon in it and less nitrogen, it may be favored. But if I have a compound that has a lot of nitrogen in it, it may be disadvantaged and may go down. So vitamin B9 has, as a for ratio of molecular weight and to the vitamin, about 22% of the molecular weight of vitamin B9 is nitrogen. And it's the one that's most adversely affected, whereas tocopherol has no nitrogen. And it was the one that was not affected at all. So I, I won't go through all the variations of this. We wanted to look at it from the perspective of 
rice is not consumed equally among all the different countries. Some countries consume more rice than others, and therefore any CO2-induced effect on nutrition will not be equally shared. So a country like Bangladesh, for example, which 70% of their calories come from rice on a daily basis, may be more impacted than other countries. So that's what that was about. Um, we're trying to work on the 10 poorest countries now. This is food production as a function of population. Uh, average for the 10 poorest countries in the world. This is population in the open circles. This is production in the closed circles. And then kilograms per person per year. You can see it going down. And then when you add the elevated CO2 effect on protein as a result of this for the basic staples within those countries, cassava, maize, potatoes, and so forth, there's an additional factor in terms of food security, not only in terms of production, but also in terms of nutritional quality. Uh, what else might be happening in terms of micronutrients and other things? We simply don't know. So plant interact by multiple means in human health from air quality to medicine to nutrition. I would just add to that that I think it's about more than just people. I think this is something to consider in the context that plants are the basis of all life. If you affect how they function, you're going to affect all of biology in ways that we don't necessarily understand or comprehend. And to give you a sense of this, there's a paper, I can't remember the reference, but it estimated all the biomass of plants and animals. So this is, all the, the human biomass is about 0.06 gigatons per carbon. All animals is about two gigatons of carbon. Plants are 450 gigatons of carbon. Or as we like to say in the plant world, plants rule, animals drool. Okay. <laughs> so understanding this aspect, I think, is extremely important in terms of understanding what the impacts are going to be. And just to finish, we acknowledge these interactions in terms of human health. I would just caution that there is the ability to do more. Um, that we need to work together, that we need to find common ground, uh, let's see, that we need to collaborate, uh, that we need to work uh, closely, uh, that we need to come up with new means and methods uh, to begin to address um, some of these issues, and that I hope that you'll work with me going forward. So thank you all very much. What proportion of the increase in pollen uh, with the elevated CO2 do you think is due to decreased plant size versus decreased production per unit? If you look at the ratio, it was mostly due to increased plant size, not so much due to um, per, per plant. So we think that as a plant gets bigger, it's simply more pollen. Yes? Has anybody looked at what, uh, so the, the herbivore biocontrol agents that, that we, like what, yeah. what the impact? Um, there's been some work quite a bit of work actually by entomologists looking at how the change in quality will affect uh, feeding habits. So Ed Fair, which is back in the 1980s, looked at um, insects were basically eating more of the leaf in order to gain the same amount of protein under a high CO2 condition. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, those, that's sort of under control laboratory study. In the real world, I don't know what the numbers might be. But I will point out that when it comes to models, which is where a lot of where our information comes from, the model impact of pests in terms of ag agriculture and food uh, security is not very well described. Not at all, actually. So, any other questions? Yes. Uh, it's kind of a segue to my question. I'm wondering if you're working with anybody trying to 
put your results in some type of a roughly physiologically based model. It seems like you have enough information you could make some predictions or at least well-structured hypotheses that, um, to, and then try to intersect those with, with yeah. some of the bigger known um, issues. We're trying to focus for the moment on nutrition, per mm -hmm. se, and what this means for differences in terms of future CO2 regarding nutritional uh, impacts on a regional basis. And um, uh, Beach, uh, Robert Beach at IFRI, International Food Policy Research Institute, and I was one of the co-authors. We put together a uh, paper that came out in Lancet Planetary Health, I think a couple months ago. On this. That being said, there's nowhere near where we're done. And so we are, I just spoke with Cynthia Rosenzweig at AGMIP, and we want to do more of this work to try and, and get a better sense of what's happening uh, with that. And that's, that's a very good point. Yes, sir. Two questions. The first yes. one is technical. I'm working with apples. In many cases, um, the tree is source limited. So do you think in such scenario, elevated CO2 benefit, would benefit fruit production? Sure, sure. Um, one of the things that we've been working on is trying to breed or try to select for wheat and rice and other uh, annual cereals to respond to more carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. um, I left this out as part of the good aspect, but is anybody <laughs> on Google right now? <laughs> no one's on Google, really? No one has their cell phone out? <clears throat> Can you go to Google for me? <laughs> okay. Would you, would you do the following for me? Yeah. Would you type carbon dioxide and marijuana? <laughs> <laughs> And tell me the first hit you get. Uh, how to use CO2 to increase yields in your marijuana crop? How to use CO2 to increase yields in your marijuana crop. So if I, yeah, I mean, you, it hasn't come to my knowledge for apple growers. <laughs> However, um, if you go online and look at the literature in more depth, you'll find out that Marijuana growers know when to apply the CO2, how much CO2 to apply, what your THC content can be, what varieties of marijuana you should apply, yada, 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 yada. Um, so all I can say is I think we're missing an opportunity here. Um, not that way, but looking at it from the point of view of food and food security as a means to begin to select for these lines that might do better, apples being one of the, one of the commodities. Thank you. Yeah. Second question. Second question. Yes. I'm. Uh, you have worked at USDA for many years. Right? Yes. Just curious, what prompted you to leave uh, USDA? Oh. <laughs> How much time do you have? <laughs> uh, if you want, if you want all the, the gory details, you can go to Google and type Politico in my last name, and you'll get more than you ever want. Right now. <laughs> um, but basically, the work that I described to you for rice. At USDA, before we submit a paper, we have to get approval. And if it's a sensitive issue, it has to be approved above the normal approval basis. There has to be somebody in the national program level that has to approve it. So when we submitted the price paper, we got approval. Uh, we sent it to science. Science said, eh. We sent it to science advances. Science advances approved it. Two months later, we get an email from the editor saying, you know, this might be a press release. So we, we asked the different authors to do a press release. And then within 24 hours, I got a, a message from USDA saying, oh, the data don't support your conclusions. Uh, what? <laughs> you mean the paper's in press, it's been peer reviewed and it's coming out and you now you think after you've approved it that the paper doesn't, no. wait, what? So we asked for details and they wouldn't meet with me, they wouldn't do anything. And then they did something that I think crossed an ethical line, which is they started calling co-authors at their institutions and saying, don't put out a press release for this. And at that point, I felt I had to look for other places to go. Thank you. One last question. Go ahead. 
Um, sometimes in plants, the, the nitrogen concentration or high nitrogen concentration, there's some suggestion that high nitrogen might be linked to lower levels of phenolics or some antioxidant yeah. uh, yeah. type. Do you see then when you get this reduction in protein, if you look at other compounds, secondary metabolites, to see if no, no, we haven't. And this is one of the big mysteries that we have. We have a little bit of data, so I, I threw that working hypothesis out there that the C to N ratio may be something that affects where these different compounds are being impacted and what's going up and what's going down. But honest to God, there's a lot that we don't know. The only thing I would say with some certainty is it's going to change. And what, how it changes under, and under what degree it changes will have ramifications. Not just for human health, but I think for many parts of the food chain. Great, I know our time is up. Let's thank Lucy. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.